Marie Vargas, they, they call you Madam Vargas around the school? Around the school they call me Madam Vargas, but I'm really a doctor in philosophy. And how did you first hear of Biscayne College? You can hear some... Well, I was teaching in Miami High at the time, and Omelia, Jim Omelia went to uh, my classes, he attended my classes, and uh, one day he told me about the problem they had in the uh, uh, language department. I had been called by Georgetown to teach there, French Lit, but I didn't want to go to Washington because Andres was in prison, I was nearer to him here and I could know uh, more about him here. So I was more available to any news, and we never knew what was going to happen, if they were going to kill him one day or the other, or whatever. So I decided not to go to Georgetown. I decided to stay here. I even had my brother in, in Washington, my brother um, Miguel, was in Washington, and he was uh, working for the OAS, but I didn't want to separate myself to the nearest place where I could be in contact with my husband. Well, the fact is that Omelia said, uh, told me about the, the a conflict they were having at the time because the dean of the foreign languages here, which was Arango, uh, had. Uh, um, left the position without any other uh, thing. So he he went and, uh, and uh, left away and he said, you go there and, uh, and uh, you apply for the position of a French. And so I came here, uh, Father Gallagher was then the dean and he uh, hired me to teach French. But Omelia told me, don't say a word about Sorbonne, speak only of the University of Havana, because they will hire you better that way. So, that was it. So I came here, was hired by, as I was telling you, by Father Gallagher, and uh, I started teaching French part-time. I came here part-time to teach French the first year. Then the next year, I was hired to start teaching more classes of French. And the second year at the end, the second semester, they wanted to install the Department of Humanities. Then they hired me full time to teach humanities. And that's how I remained here day by day, as we all have done. <laughs> We all worked, and we did all kinds of work around the school. You were very fond of Amelia, weren't you? I was very fond of Amelia. Amelia was a, one of those extraordinary human beings that was extremely intelligent, uh, was not uh, the kind of uh, pushing his intelligence around, practical intelligence, a uh, very good friend, uh, very sincere and a very strong character behind a very easy way of uh, promoting himself. And uh, I have missed him always after his death. Do you remember where you were when you heard of his death? I was, yes. I was in the room here, up there, where we had uh, the room. and I don't like to cry, but I start crying. I start crying, but I didn't want to cry. Then I went to his little place where he used to sit there behind, you know, one of the cubicles, and I took something that he was, a pen he was using all the time, and I put it in my drawer because I wanted to keep this thing he had. We had a great affection. I mean, not only myself, but everybody loved Omelia. He's one of the great uh, imprints of Santo Tomas, the Villanueva. 
uh, in this modern Biscayne College. And we will miss him on over. In fact, I always thought that had he been alive, many of the problems we have had lately wouldn't have happened. Because he was a man capable of stabilizing things. Had you ever heard of him in Cuba at all? Uh, no, not really. In Cuba, no, because I was uh, in the uh, Central University of Havana. I was not in, uh, among the people of Villanueva. We consider them uh, goody goodies. <laughs> they were Catholic, kind of wealthy Catholic kids who didn't want to be exposed to communism, right? They were not exactly uh, wealthy or more Catholics than some others in the university. Uh, besides, I'm a Catholic. It sounds Catholic and a practical Catholic, and above everything to me is God and my Catholic Church. But uh, the, the thing is that they were not exposed to the things of life. Uh, they had an easy life, they were taken care, they were preserved. And this, uh, we always thought, was not, uh, they should have been. Uh, on the go with the others and fighting against the things and that's what we thought. We were mistaken in many ways. Your origin is uh, French? Uh... Yes. My mother was a French, a Russian. I what was her name? Her name was uh, Marie-Thérèse uh, Rostopchin and de Castilla because one of the Castilla, uh, she came from the uh, Santa Cruz. Uh, she, one of her great grandmothers, uh, one of her, yes, married a Spaniard, so they had some Spanish blood through them. Uh, and Marquesa Santa Cruz, the famous, was an ancestor, uh, the son of Philip II. Yes. And your, uh, your father? And my father, he was from a Celtic. Uh, from uh, Spain. Uh, my, he was born in Cuba, but his parents were Asturianos. And uh, he was a clear Celt. He was very witty, uh, very. Uh, he enjoyed life. He was always in good uh, humor. What did he do for a living? Uh, my father started being a criminal, uh, criminologist. He was a lawyer in criminology. He won two very important processes, but one of them, he got out a man that he was convinced he was not. Uh, guilty. He was guilty. Yeah. He was guilty, and he got him out yeah. because he was a great speaker and a great. Convince the. Uh, Where was he educated? Uh, he was educated with the Jesuits, uh, Spain and Cuba, with the Jesuits always. And then he started in the University of Havana. He was a lawyer when he was 18 years old. And then he started also in Heidelberg and in Louvain. And how did he meet your mother? He met my mother in France as a young diplomat, and uh, he, uh, they married. My mother was, uh, her mother was the Comtesse de Cairon, and uh, my, they had houses in Paris and a reception. He met my mother, and he, they were very much in love till the end of their life. He was a very, very, uh, how can I say, devoted to her. He was extremely devoted to her. And he gave us a great uh, example of uh, extraordinary devotion to a woman. He died? Uh, he died here? In, this, in Miami? Yes, in Miami, uh, around uh, when he was like 86 years almost. And, uh, but he was a man that uh, was a peculiar character. He had the greatest wit in the world. And uh, he, 
it was not easy to reach on spite of that. And he always said, Castro hasn't been able to take away from me the peace I feel, the happiness of being in such a great country as this, and having the pleasure of being in this house with this garden, this beautiful trees. That is a pleasure he will never feel. He was speaking of, of, of where? Of Castro. But he was speaking of what country? Here. Of the United States? In the United States. Did he live with you in those, in he those last years? He lived with me and he died with me. I was always, uh, I was very close to him since my uh, very early age, since I remember my life. In fact, they always told me that he had a big oil painted by a very uh, good painter. His name was uh, Rivera and a Spanish, very well-known painter. And he was a very elegant p painting of his likeness, a picture, a portrait. And when he left, they always put the portrait where I could see him because I was so little, I thought he was there. And I spoke with him for a long time, like long tirades. And uh, uh, once I went he had a spot in the eye, apparently something had fallen in the picture. And I went to clean his eye, and when he didn't answer, and I put the finger into his eye, I started screaming, because I noticed he was not there. They had to send for him to the embassy to come. And he explained to me, he always explained to me, everything that had to be explained to me in life was explained by my father. And your mother? My mother was a very beautiful woman, extremely refined, elegant, uh, very cared for by everybody, adored by the boys in the house. We were at 12 brothers and two sisters. She was uh, adored by my father, and she was uh, a little remote, if you want in the sense that we were invited to see her at certain hours of the day. And, uh, but when we were sick, she sat by us, and she comforted us. And so, so you were sort of raised by a nanny or something? Oh, yes. I was raised first by a Briton a nanny, wet nanny, uh, they call her, and then by a regular nanny that took me. My nanny was great love of my life. Uh, she, she wasn't too pretty, but we call her La Belotte, the beautiful one. I call her La Belotte because I found her so belle that I call her La Belotte, the big belle. <laughs> Where was this now? What, what city was this? In, uh, in, uh, I was born the 17, 1917. And I was uh, born in Paris. But I was taken three weeks after to my grandmother uh, in Brittany to the Chateau de Quetron, where I lived until I started school at five or six years. Then I, I had to come to Paris, but for going to the Sacred Heart where I was raised, I was uh, educated. And uh, I prayed day and night for my grandmother, my horse, my dog and my grandmother in this order. <laughs> the horse was the most important character. That, that home you lived in, was, isn't it a rather famous building? It is. It's the Chateau de Cargent, which, which is today the museum of the uh, uh, Britain uh, furniture. It uh, has the old closed beds that were the, uh, the uh, system of the uh, it was so cold that they slept there in closed beds, like closets. And uh, they were all carved and all very beautiful. And uh, my grandmother, before I was born, got her children together, because in the old time, we had the same laws as the um, English. The eldest inherited everything, and he had to provide for everybody. But. Later, we had to join the laws of France, where every child inherits its part equally. And um, 
I mean, you can better one of them if you want, but they all get some inheritance. It was very difficult to divide the inheritance, so she called her children and said, I don't want this old house that was built by my ancestors, because she was the Countess de Cargon by on her own merits. She was uh, really the wife of a rough subsheet of uh, Remy, uh, Remy uh, Alexis Rassabchin, whom she separated from and obtained from the church a se legal separation from the church, not a divorce, because they did not accept a divorce. This is a long story, a very, uh, uh, it's a very interesting story, the separation, but it's too long to, to be told here. It's, uh, she wasn't happy. Uh, the man was all the time having orgies in the house and things like that. He was like a Dostoevsky uh, <laughs> man <laughs> character. and. She asked permission to separate, and she left Russia with her ten children in slaves, and she brought them to France. And her her brother was the Count of Cherson. And uh, when he died, he was married. He left her the title because the, most of the brothers and sisters were in the convent. They were nuns and priests. So. This was the, uh, I was raised by her. I went to Paris then for, to, for the purpose of education. But I escaped from my home to go back to, to Brittany one night. I escaped thinking I was going to Brittany. I would have ended in Germany <laughs> because I didn't know the direction. But then I came, my father took me back to Brittany for a year or more. And then she came with me to Paris to stay a little time until I got uh, accustomed. Then I went to the Secretariat of Saint Rue Saint Dominique, and I traveled with my parents. And when I was like seven years old, I went to England to school to the Secretariat of Hampton, and uh, I was there until I was in age of going to my back. The bac bac baccalauréat in France. I did my lycée and then I did my university. I became a philosopher. Please bring You knew some uh, famous people in Paris from the early yes, days? I uh, met a lot of famous people, but uh, there was the, the great musician Nin, N I N, who was the father of Anaïs Nin. And uh, that man, who was a friend of my father, we were admitted to the, uh, sometimes uh, to the teas they gave. To, uh, it was, uh, at that time, the receptions in the afternoon, the families had one day to receive people. My parents had a day marked for reception days. And among the people that frequented those reception days, like a sort of salon, uh, they received uh, musicians and they received uh, writers and poets and uh, all kinds of intellectuals. And among them was Joaquin Nin. And uh, we were allowed, if we had behaved well, to come and say hello to them. And uh, then disappear, never appear again. According to the system of the children, it must be seen and never heard. So we went there to be shown, and we disappeared. But Joaquin Lin had had a, a divorce of his wife, and his children had been taken away by the wife. I mean, taken away or accepted to be taken. I don't know that process. But the fact is that uh, he always sort of felt a little. So he paid attention to his children. And he said, what do you know how to sing? I said. Well, we have a, a nanny that has shown me songs. Oh, so he said, wait a minute, we'll go to a piano, we'll play songs. And 
He said, you sing very well. So I want to, I'm having uh, some musicians in my house. Uh, it was a Friday every 15 days, every, every other Friday. Or I, I want you to go there and help me to serve the tea. So I was very, very uh, thrilled with the idea. And immediately I asked for two new dresses. I had a white dress pleated and I had a brown dress embroidered in red. And I was extremely coquette in that. So I prepared my dresses and I went there. I sang different songs, Spanish songs, because we had also a Spanish uh, nanny that taught us, spoke with us in Spanish. She taught me the uh, children's songs popular songs among the Spaniards. And uh, we had this, uh, she was Catalonian, so she told me to sing in Catalonian. And uh, Nin was a Catalonian origin, and he was very um, proud of his Catalonian origin. So he made me sing these popular songs. This, uh, and I used to go and sing there. I was, imagine, uh, met by the great musicians of the time. Uh, he was a great friend of uh, the painters. I met uh, Bertrand Lassès, who painted uh, the famous toreros in Spain. And I met there um, Arthur Honecker. I met there um, Stravinsky. I met there all the great uh, uh, painters and the great uh, uh, musicians. I even met Picasso there. And uh, I met Vasquez Diaz, who later was my teacher. You would have, you would have been about how old at this time? Uh, I must have been uh, uh, around uh, it was vacations times, and so it must have been between seven and eight, something like that. But then he made me serve the tea to everybody. So that was a great thing, because I received a lot of compliments, and uh, I, I exacted two new dresses more in my family. I forced them to buy me two more dresses. Because I was in high society at the moment, I had to uh, dress up my position among the people. So I convinced my mother, who, who was very French, she liked the children to be very modest, and very, she, she made two dresses more. Uh, it seems to be one time you told me about either of Stravinsky or Onegar, or one of them, that he, you remember the, smelling the liquor on his breath or yeah. something. Yes, Stravinsky. Yeah. Stravinsky was, and uh, uh, I, I, I didn't like Stravinsky too much. Uh, Honegger was a, a, a darling man. Honegger, Arthur Honegger was a great, and uh, I hear, heard them speaking, especially Honegger was a great talker. Uh, Stravinsky didn't talk too much. Stravinsky was all the time drunk. Sometimes he conducted the orchestra uh, completely, uh, uh, you know, unstable on his feet. Then I saw Stravinsky many years after in Havana, when he went to conduct the Philharmonic uh, Orchestra of Havana. And I found him the same thing, except thinner and older. But the same thing, uh, not holding himself quite straight. He was a great conductor, in spite of it. He was a great... Uh, one day, uh, he even played the blue bird for me, the, the pájaro. Uh, 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 I called it the blue bird because I had uh, read the, uh, the story of Metterlich, which was looking for the bird of happiness, the blue bird. And I made a relation with the, uh, the 
bird of Stravinsky and the bird of Metternich. So the viewer in Paris, uh, this was about the time when Hemingway was there, uh, uh, Ezra Pound, James Joyce, and Edith, uh, Gertrude Stein had her. Gertrude Stein, I uh, met. Rue de Flore, she had her apartment yes. there. Uh, I met Wanda Landowski. Yes, yeah, the harpsichordist. Yes, she was a friend of my father, and my father used to take me there. She was very uh, flirty. She wore very loose clothes, and she sat to the uh, um, harpsichord like a butterfly, uh, just to posing herself on a flower. And she was uh, a very uh, and. Uh, she she said, you should learn how to play the harpsichord. And I said, I don't want to play the harpsichord. I want to paint. And she says, you're mistaken. I said, yes, but I want to be mistaken. And she was very, uh, very, like a, Supir, we call it in French, like a breath. She very tall, thin. Who is, who is your, of all the artists you've either met or known the about? The one I remember with more affection, besides Nim, which introduced me to this world <laughs> and was very affectionate with me uh, and took me seriously, you know, in, at that time, the children were not taken very seriously. Uh, the Honegger, Arthur Honegger, always uh, impressed me as a very good man besides every other thing. He was a Swiss, was he not? He was a Swiss. Yeah. I saw him later in Switzerland, uh, a year before his death. He was. His last words were, uh, unless you come very soon, you won't see me again. And uh, that was it. So you, you, we went on and you went to the University to, uh, to the Sorbonne in Paris, yes, University Paris. of Paris. I was you a student. You studied art or philosophy? Or? Yes, philosophy. Uh, I had a brother that I love very much who would have been a, a, a great philosopher. So. I went uh, to study philosophy, and uh, I was uh, I went to the uh, Collège de France, and I attended the courses of Bergson, which I really re remember as one of the greatest influences in my life. I uh, also oh I met a lot of uh, I met uh, Chardin. And his brother was a great friend of my father. Both of them had been in the University of Louvain together. And uh, I met... Uh, Did you ever meet Camus? I met Camus, yes. I met Camus once. Uh, he impressed me extremely. Uh, not so much uh, uh, the other existentialist, uh, what's his name? Uh, Sartre? Sartre. I didn't like Sartre. He rang me as a uh, harsh man, uh, hard, uh, a man that was after his own interest on his own. Uh, he was a snob to uh, Camus. No? Camus was very spiritual, what we call in French spiritual, which means witty and uh, light in his conversation. Camus was heavy. Uh, Camus, uh, I mean, um, Sartre was heavy. And uh, he, he had a great German influence. So I didn't uh, sympathize with, Cam uh, with uh, Sartre. On the other hand, I like Camus. I met Saint-Ex, Saint-Exupéry. Uh, the Val de Nuit, yes. He died, as he, as he described there. That's why some people think he committed suicide, because it was 
very much like the book he wrote that he got lost. Now they have found, lately, I don't know if you read that in the newspapers, they have found an airplane rests of something that they think is the airplane of Saint X. So, it's, uh, I had a very amusing life. I have been a very lucky woman. I met the man I loved. I have been very happy with him. Tell me about Andres Vargas Gomez. How did you meet him? I met him in Paris when I was very young. Then we met again, and later we decided to get married, and uh, we have been like already forty something, almost fifty years, more than fifty years. So I'm seventy-two. I married him when I was young, and. Uh, as you know, he was twenty years. Uh, he's an idealist and uh, a patriot and a man of great uh, convictions and very straightforward. I admire him, respect him a, a lot, besides loving him, because as my grandmother said, you love your dog and you love your cat and you love your animals, but you respect God and you respect the people that are superior to you. And Characteristics. So I have for him a great respect. You uh, at one point moved from Paris to Havana. When was uh, that? Yes, I, I, I went. My father had been born in Cuba. I was born in Cuba. Uh, my father, my great, my grandparents, my grandfather was a military a Spanish man. Uh, Artie, he was. Uh, he fought against Maximo Gomez. He fought against Andres' grandfather. And he, when Cuba was freed, they left for Spain because they, he was a staunch. But they had lands in Cuba, lots of lands that I don't know if they had inherited from another, uh, from one of the ancestors, or they acquired. I don't know very well. But they had uh, lots of land. And. Uh, they eventually went back and forth. My father studied. My father, being born in Cuba, uh, uh, became uh, he didn't uh, renounce to his citizenship, so he became automatically a uh, a Cuban citizen. And he liked the idea of having a new country. He was in many ways at the beginning of his life. And he was at the end of his life, always a liberal, a Catholic liberal. He was a man of uh, great uh, libertarian ideas. He was a man of his time, you see. He was a man of the 19th century, end of the 19th century. And uh, beginning, he was born there in uh, 82. He was born in uh, 1882. And uh, he. Uh, he lived uh, the time of La Belle Epoque with my mother. They went for their, uh, for their uh, honeymoon to Austria and uh, to Italy, and uh, the regular uh, people taking a wedding uh, trip, and they always uh, look at, the, at each other when they spoke about those countries. And they had a secret internal life between them both the blue Danube and all these uh, things. But, uh, it was a poetical union, my father and my mother. And uh, he liked to, he graduated uh, in the University of Havana. Then he went back and he was a very well known lawyer. He started his life as a journalist uh, when he started writing in the newspapers and then. He uh, became a criminal lawyer, and he, as I was telling you at the beginning, he uh, earned this process, this process, this, uh, and uh, he didn't like the idea of defending guilty people. Uh, he was a very, uh, he was not a solemn man, but he was a very pure man in his 
ideas very straightforward. He was never solemn, not even in his virtues. He was always a man uh, uh, that could see the laughing side of everything. And uh, he, at the time the Republic was young, and they appointed him as an undersecretary in the uh, legation. They were not in business yet, of Paris. There he met my mother. He, he, they were wealthy people, both on both sides, so they could marry and raise a family. He became immediately prominent in his career. He was immediately ascended, uh, given a, a secretary, uh, first secretary, and chargé d'affaires, minister, and ambassador. And we're in, now we're in, in Cuba now. Uh, no, no, in, in Europe. We we're lived in, in Europe. You lived in we Europe? Did. Yes, we lived in Europe. Uh, he went to, sometimes to Cuba, but we remain in France. So when he was, you say he was an ambassador, uh, he, from where to where? From what country uh, to he what was, country? He was an ambassador to Japan. He was an ambassador to Spain. Representing Australia. France? Yeah. No, no, Cuba. Representing Cuba? He, Cuba. He, my mother was a French one. He was half Spanish, uh, and his mother had some, something of French. Uh, but uh, he was a Spaniard uh, by birth. Uh, I mean, and a Cuban by birth. He was born in Cuba when it was still Spaniard. But uh, when Cuba was free, those that did not say no became automatically, the born there became automatically Cubans. So he took that advantage to live in Cuba. He, he loved a young country and a young idea, and, uh, and he, uh, he went there. He, he was very uh, happy. As I tell you, he was a remarkable wit, you know, a real. Uh, when I read Bernard Shaw, in many ways he was not as witty. He really had this uh, thinking. This he saw always the laughing part of things, and he, he made anthological phrases about the people. He had two or three uh, people with whom he didn't get along, and. He ridiculed them just with one or two phrases. <laughs> he put them in, in a, he had always the remarkable answer to everything. And like his daughter? Well, no, not so much. I'm a little shadow of what he was. He was a remarkable intelligence. Well, I, I wanted you to, to tell me where you have lived. In other words, you grew up in, in, essentially France, in Paris. In England. And after Paris? You England. Lived in England. England. I lived in uh, Holland. Now, are you, are you married at this point? No, no, no. I, still, it was my infancy. Still studying. Yes, uh, studying. Yes. And, after, but, and but Spain. After you graduated from the, the Sorbonne. Yes. Where did you uh, live? It was at? after the war, dear, because it was interrupted. Our graduations were interrupted by the uh, war. Uh -huh. And uh, I lived after I got married. I lived in uh, Switzerland constantly, in Geneva, because Andres was a, a, uh, a uh, was with the delegate, uh, the head of the, the ambassador to the GATT, to, uh, to all the United Nations of European organizations. I was myself. You knew the Beau Rivage, did you? The Beau Rivage, yeah. yes. It was, on? it was a very uh, swanky hotel at the time. Yeah. Now it is a sort of uh, gone uh, passé, huh? the Beau Rivage. Uh, the uh, Russie was a great hotel, which today it isn't. Uh, the you went to a lot of parties, I'm sure. Oh, yes, that is. You've known yeah. great highs and great lows. I mean, you've known great wealth and and great excitement, and you've known the, uh, the other extremes well, as well. Well, I came as a refugee here. Uh, I went through the war, which I considered I had to fight for my country. And then after that, uh, things were happy again. And then my husband got to entangled with the uh, Bay of Peace, and we both infiltrated into Cuba. Well, before we get there, though, you. You lived in, I, I remember hearing someone tell me that you lived in Madrid and that you lived in the 
Palace Hotel there, and you had your... No, your, the Palace, no, no, in the Ritz. In the Ritz, and you had your, what do you call, atelier, or your... Yeah, I had an atelier, the, I had in, a in, in studio, yes, yeah. yes, I did. When was that, when would that have been? What years? Uh, that was uh, during the years uh, 40, after the Civil War. It was like after the Spanish, the Spanish Civil, Civil War, War yes. Uh, and why were you living then in Madrid? Uh, because uh, I, went, I, I was painting. I was dedicated completely to painting, and I went to live there. There I was... Um, I started two years with Vasquez Diaz. Immediately I started to show, make shows, and uh, they were very successful. Didn't Salvador Dali give you yes. a compliment? Yeah, no, a compliment of several ones. <laughs> he hired me to help him. You, you actually knew him? Yes. Oh, yes. He went to the Biennale, where I was exposing some uh, uh, pictures of mine, and he made uh, a public uh, Mm, declaration that of what he had seen in the Biennale, the only uh, uh, painter with character was myself. So it was imagine immediately all the newspapers came to me and published it all over, and, and uh, the critics already had given me a very good critic. Then he hired two students of Vasquez Diaz, or two of the ex-students of Vasquez Diaz, to help him in his work. And I helped him. Uh, we were like two years working with him. Uh, of course, the help consisted on this. Uh, he went to uh, the, the Don Juan Tenorio, which he made all these scenarios for it. We were the ones that painted. Then he came and <laughs> took away what we have done. and. Uh, Redid it or changed it, but he gave us always the uh, the sketches to copy. So we were that way. Then he wanted to hire me to continue to help him in the, but I didn't like his personality. I never liked uh, Vasquez Diaz's personality. Uh, uh, Vasquez Diaz, but I'm sorry, uh, uh, Dalis. He was a man that faked everything. He was a great faker. And uh, he did it uh, uh, because he thought it should be done that way. Uh, it was a, a politic in his life to fake things. And you know, I am. You know me enough now, after working here so many years together, and that I'm incapable of faking. I can fake for a time, but <laughs> a minute, three. But immediately you'll see the my ear coming out possible for me to hide my way of thinking. And, and so you worked with, when you were working with Dali, that was in, in Madrid, or? I, it was in Madrid. What? I was four years in Madrid. What are your recollections of living in, of life in Madrid? Oh, the life in Madrid at that time was marvelous. I lived uh, perhaps a little in a bohemian way, uh, rather than uh, diplomatic, though I was appointed as a attaché culturel cultural attaché. But uh, I had to go there and do my things and uh, reports and write. It was among my own uh, trade, among arts and things like that. So it was an interesting position. Then I was sent as a delegate to UNESCO. There I met Ingrid Bergman and Rossellini. And everybody used to say, hey, Ingrid Bergman was so beautiful. She was a beautiful woman. But she had a passivity, sort of a cowish. She, she licked her lips all the time, something that uh, made me think of a, a very sweet cow. <laughs> she was also pregnant at the time. What was this? Uh, Any better? Uh, it must have been the years uh, 50, uh, 52, 53. Uh, around those years. And uh, Rossellini was with her. She just had married Rossellini. And she was pregnant of those kids that are running around the world now. And uh, she didn't like her. I mean, she was a pretty woman. The lines were interesting, uh, more interesting. 
less interesting than really beautiful, what you call pretty, uh, but not exactly. Uh, I met uh, Blasetti, the great uh, director. I met uh, uh, the, the, the other Italian who is very famous too. Uh, what's his name? Uh, <laughs> Zeffirelli, or...? No, no, it's not a, 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 a more, an older one. Uh, uh, the, uh, who did the... Uh, Rossellini did the... Uh, the the, um, the one who... The bicycle thief. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, Marvin upstairs. Yes. Well... In any case... Uh, in any case. So... Tell me when you moved from Europe to to Cuba. Well, uh, my father had moved to Cuba more steadily uh, because he was appointed Minister of States. He was a Minister of States for two or three times, and uh, in dip uh, he had he was the one who structured the uh, diplomatic career in Cuba. Uh, he really built it. it. It was one of the best things in Cuba was the diplomatic career, where only the very honest people were admitted, the very honorable people and things. It was a very good foreign service because my father looked up to that. And then it had prominent people uh, as Minister of State, uh, Don Cosme La Torrente, uh, Jose Manuel Cortina, uh, people that were really prominent in the country. So it was a minister, a ministry that kept uh, very, very uh, separated from the political things. By the way, before we, before we go to Cuba, during the war, the war years, you were in uh, in Paris in Paris in during Paris. the war years. Yes, Do you I remember, for instance, when Hitler came to Paris? Uh, no, I went after. Uh, you mean his visit? His visit. Yes. He visited, oh, yes, one, he yes. visited one day. No, no, I thought invasion. No, no, he actually visited yes. one day. No, I remember, yes, I remember. But uh, you see, what I remember, I was very much in the underground. Yeah. I was a liaison officer appointed by the court director. And uh, I was there really uh, working hard in the underground. and. Uh, the attitude of the people was uh, of fear, despise, aspiration, uh, discontent, uh, even with the French, because our France was collaborationist. And you see, we were, um, it's not like uh, if you say, do you remember when uh, uh, Limburg arrived? <laughs> you see, it's, it's a different thing. It was. Uh, Hatred and desire to to ignore them. To uh, it's a different case. Uh, you look at it as an event. We look at it as a uh, another horrible thing happened. <laughs> well, I, mean, I always remember that famous picture of the when the Germans were marching into Paris of the man with the tears yes, on his yes. cheeks. The, we were uh, all crying and all desperate and didn't see any. Uh, I had an aunt that had girls uh, killed, murdered, shot in the garden of the house by the German soldiers. Four daughters? Four killed. daughters, yes. What, how did they behave, the German soldiers? Did they rape the women and uh, things like that? They behaved like all soldiers in the world. <laughs> the rapism, the drinking of all our wine, which was a sort of rape of everybody. <laughs> the, uh, the uh, You know, they they went into our cellars and took away everything we had, and they, and then they tried to take away uh, our works of art, which, incredibly, were saved by that strategy of getting the train to go around and around. And they thought they were going to Germany, and they changed the names of the station. This is, they did the picture of that, but it's it's a it's a fact. They changed the names of the stations. It was a, a thing of the resistance. And uh, they never got, got out of France. 
they came back. So, I, it was something. Then I went to Cuba because I wasn't there the last uh, day, uh, the last year of the war. I was oh, in Cuba. that's when you moved to Cuba. I had to because uh, I was already known. So they uh, put me in charge of getting places for the uh, wounded soldiers in con convalescent places. The Americans wouldn't admit them here, the French soldiers. Uh, Roosevelt had an arrangement with the Russians and uh, he didn't want anybody, they, he didn't want the goal to, to be anything and he tried to ignore the goal. Uh. And uh, they wouldn't even give us a camp for getting the convalescent soldiers. So we had to go to Santo Domingo where we got from all people of Trujillo uh, a camp. And the goal went there to visit at a certain moment to Santo Domingo. And then I was in Cuba raising funds and doing things what I could. So then, from then on, you lived in Cuba until? Until, the... uh, yes, because my father was appointed Minister of State again. Then my mother died at 52. I had to accompany my father. I became my father's hostess. Then my father was appointed as a as a uh, ambassador to Washington. So he was here five years, and I came with him to install the embassy and to do to be his hostess. And then my sister came because I had to go with my husband to to Switzerland. So that was. So you live in Switzerland and the. This would be late 40s or early 50s? Uh, yes, in late 50s. We were, my husband was a delegate until, uh, in fact, his uh, resignation was done in Paris, but he was still ambassador to the United Nations in Switzerland. So you were you were not living really in Cuba when Fidel Castro was in the Sierra Maestras. No, when he was uh, when he came down from the uh, the Sierra Maestra, yeah. we were in Cuba. But he was one of the very uh, I think it was the only ambassador he respected was uh, my uh, my husband. Most of the what was the feeling of most of the Cuban people? when Castro was still in the hills? Was he regarded as a savior? Uh, there was such a, a, po a political immorality in Cuba and such a disorder in the political uh, field that the people uh, welcomed anything. And then a great repression, huh? Batista was killing students and Batista was killing people, the people surrounding Batista were murdering students because we didn't come from heaven huh? at the time. It's blinking. So that is, the, we didn't believe so much in Fidel as in the new people coming. Castro was always considered a madman in many ways. Had you known him at the University of Havana at all? Uh, pardon me? Had you known Castro at the University of Havana? Uh, I knew Castro, yes, from many years ago. He had a reputation for being He had a reputation for being a bunch, like a man, a bunch man. The bunch were the people that gathered together for killing and doing things, yeah. extortions and things. He, he had uh, been a bunch man before. But he went also to uh, Bogota, and he was part of what they called the Bogotazo, which was a coup d'etat they gave in, uh, and he was instrumental to killing his best friend, whose name was Castro too, but he was no relation to him, but he, he was his best friend. Castro was a criminal born, I mean, he was a man of, so, uh, what time is it, dear? 15, you have 15 minutes. Oh, I have. Nothing of this. Yes, I do. Okay. Yes. The uh, so Fidel came to power. Your husband continued working for uh, 
uh, Cuba, but you say he resigned? He resigned. Oh, and, and uh, Geneva, he, or? Uh, he, uh, he plotted to go out because he knew that he, if he resigned in Cuba, he would be put into jail and myself too. So we went to Switzerland back. We went back to Switzerland. He organized a delegation because after all, don't forget it, that the interest of his country was very important for him. And then after a month there, he decided that I'll come here. We were in contact with the American government and they told us, you can come here, you can, they gave us all the facilities to come here. So he went to Paris. I came by boat because we had Cinco the dog, the famous dog. And um, uh, I came by boat with him and the maid. We had a maid. I always carried a maid with me. She, she took care of me while I traveled and all. And, um, she, uh, the maid, the sink, and I came. To came to? To the United States, to New York. We arrived by boat. Uh, the United States is the boat that brought us back. Uh, he was waiting already for me because he had gone to Paris. He had resigned in Paris and he had given a press uh, conference. conference and then he took an airplane and was in New York before I was. So we decided to come to live in Miami. We came here and we rented a house in, uh, from a doctor called Bashline. And then, and then you decided to go back and infiltrate? My husband was sending messages. He spoke for, uh, through the radio every day for Cuba. It was a, a thing called For Cuba, For Cuba y Para Cuba. And uh, it was a radio, it was transmitted, retransmitted by Radio Swan. And uh, spoke every day. He did a terrible campaign to to raise the Cubans against Castro. From Miami. From Miami. Yeah. But then he was uh, the kind of person that thought that it was very comfortable to raise the people from Miami. And he decided to go a time before Bay of Pigs. He was in the, in the conspira uh, conspiration of Bay of Pigs. He went as a civil, and I went with him. We infiltrated in a boat of 20, uh, 23 feet. We went all over the place, and uh, it was a fishing boat. And uh, first thing I had to do when I reached Cuba, after sneaking in the, under the eyes of all the milicians guarding the coast and all that, under the fish, all over me fish, and over my husband and everything. We had to take showers, and the three, four, five showers to take away the smell of fish we had on top of us. So uh, we, um, we went to Cuba to prepare the Bay of Pigs. And we traveled from one place to the other. Uh, Where did you, did, who were you traveling as? Were you in disguise? Or uh, you uh, we went in disguise, and we uh, invented new names and new not disguised physically. He, Andres uh, dyed his hair because Andres has uh, white hair since he was very, very young. Uh, not so white as now, but uh, he had and more than he has now, more hair. <laughs> and um, didn't you bring your dog with you too? Yes. Why did you why Why did you complicate it by bringing your dog? No, it was not a complication. It was uh, a sort of hiding. Because uh, if they caught us, and that's the way they release us, because we went three times to prison, and we were three times released. They didn't recognize us, because we said we were hunting with a dog. And uh, uh, we went distributing uh, arms and things. You were setting up the Bay of Pigs. Yes. 
and uh, raising the people. And they agree, but the uh, the things the Americans uh, abandon us. The dear Kennedy people abandon us. And well, had you had you felt you had some support from the United States? No, originally. no, we didn't think. We were sure because it promised. <laughs> CIA had some. Not CIA, Kennedy. My husband had an interview with uh, uh, Jack Kennedy. You actually met Jack Kennedy? Oh, yes. Uh, I tell you honestly, I don't think it was the work of Jack Kennedy. I think it was the, the work of the brother of uh, Bobby. Bobby Kennedy with uh, that man that was in the United Nations. Uh, his name was... Uh, Stevenson? Stevenson, Adlai Stevenson. And uh, he promised there uh, that the Americans wouldn't. So when he saw the thing, he never knew about it. He came, he sent Bobby, and Bobby and him came to see the president. They raised hell to him. They convinced him that it was going to destroy this country and make you in war, in war with the Russians and all this and this and that. And well, you know, I don't have to tell you, it's, those documents are published and everybody knows. And they just abandoned us. There, there was a chaos in Cuba. Everybody was put to jail in case. Everybody was shot and everybody was... Uh, but you had been, uh, you and Andres had been arrested before the Bay of Pigs. At one, at, yes. at one point? How? Three point, three times. <laughs> Uh, uh, two times. And the why did they things. arrest you? Why? Uh, because uh, you were arrested for not being in your province. You were arrested for walking the street. You were arrested because you didn't belong to that uh, section of the city. You were arrested for any thing. Yeah. There was a curfew. There was. A, it must have been, weren't you terribly scared? Uh, when you're so scared, you're not scared. It's an incredible thing. You're galvanized by fear in such a way that you become cold. And I have been always very cold in, those, in dangers. Probably my father, in that sense, always said, don't panic. Uh, he was always in that sense. I remember I was in a fire one day, and... Uh, the people were just uh, uh, almost killing one each other, passing over. And I saw immediately that I had to keep back. I was thin and little, but I immediately put three, four, five chairs and climbed through a little window that was in the movie, and I jumped out. The other people were burned and destroyed. I wasn't even touched. I, because I remember my father in the middle of the thing, don't panic. And I said, well, I mustn't panic. And this, whenever I was arrested, I prayed. I prayed to the Lord to make me invisible to the eyes that shouldn't see me. So you, so you went over there uh, on a boat from Miami. Uh, do you recall where you went? We were supposed to enter at 5 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. We entered at 10 o'clock when all the guard was there because there was a uh, storm. We left from Key Marathon, I can tell you now. You were delayed, so you arrived at the daylight, during the daylight. <laughs> at 10 o'clock in Havana. We, you know, you came into Havana Harbor? we had some... Uh, uh, arms and paraphernalia there. Yeah. Arms. So the the uh, compasses went crazy. And my husband, to make fun of me, had given me a little compass that we bought in the 10 cents in Marathon. A little compass, you know, 10 cents or 25 cents. That is the only compass we had that worked. The big compasses, the real uh, electronic, that were 
because we had too many uh, uh, steel in the, on the boat. And you had, of course, somebody to meet you there? Uh, no, no, but it was meet. No. No, no, no. We knew what we had to do. Uh, we were disembarking, in, uh, and uh, we had to go through a... Uh, the coast in Cuba are filled with mangroves, and there was canals in that part where we disembarked. And uh, I don't say where it was because it's still used. And uh, we were going to contact there, through the canals, some man who was waiting for us. And so we did. We were five in the boat. The only woman, of course, was this one. And so you then did your work for some with a few interruptions being arrested for some weeks? Oh, we worked in the underground, going here, yes, we did work. But we were taken prisoners a little time after. But we were released because there was in the famous theater Blanquita, where there were Father uh, McCarthy was there. Under arrest? under arrest. When he entered, the people start applauding, and the milicians start shooting with the metrajets. And you were held there? I was there. I was there for a week. Then they released me. In this theater? It was a movie theater? Yeah, a movie theater. How did the you, people how did, you did live everything in there in the middle of the theater. It was the smell, the stench. The horror, the urines, and everything uh, you were filled up to here. A week without food, without anything. I had provided myself with two, and then they separated Andres from me. They sat Andres in a place and me in another, but I could see him. I never took my eyes from him. Because I said, if we'll recognize him, he wouldn't be even taken. They will shoot him there. But they then released you finally. You had a French, you had, what did you have, some kind of French passport? Uh, yes, I had a French. I had never stopped being French. And uh, uh, we... Where was the dog in the meantime? The dog, uh, that's a long story, because they took us, when we went there, uh, the dog was, uh, uh, we had entered through a place, and this was in Havana. So we were taken there as a prisoner, and I brought the dog into Havana with me. The miliciano that brought us wanted to take the dog away. They liked the dog. And I convinced the man that, you see, don't take the dog. Well, he said, I was praying or praying. That's my great help in life, in every place, in every situation. And uh, they asked me, uh, the, the miliciano was called on the phone for a quick thing. So he said, I'll come after to take the dog. I said, okay. Well, that time I convinced the miliciano, another miliciano, you see this dog is bothering me now. We were hunting, but now I have a lady, a rich lady, that wants to buy the dog. She lives here around, and if you can, uh, uh, let me telephone her. She'll give me $15 for the dog. And you see, I'm, I was posing as a seamstress. <laughs> so I convinced him, compañero, please, let me get those $15, because it will help me here to buy food and this, uh, uh, of course. The man took a little pity of me and let me, I called my cousin and I said, the Mrs. Uh, so I am Maria, your, your seamstress, and you, uh, I have the dog with they By now, this part of the family knew that we had disembarked and uh, all that. So she immediately said, okay, I'll give you the $15, don't worry, but uh, can, uh, 
I said, you come here, we'll bargain here, because you see, I would like $15, you, uh, no, not 13 So the man said, take out of her the $15. I said, I'll try to. So I went to the door with her, they let me, I come to, and she came, she didn't recognize me. I said, don't you recognize me, Mrs. So-and-so? She said, well, you were the one that made the, uh, because I had said your, your seamstress. You made me, uh, I remember a dress or a, a, a shirt, a skirt. She, I said, exactly. And this is the dog you wanted to buy from me then. So now you can take it. They took the dog and it disappeared with the dog. It was safe. And then immediately they changed me to another prison. There, I think they were starting to suspect because that was the last time I was a, uh, before I had been a prisoner with the uh, with the dog, but there they took, they wanted they, they let me get rid of the dog. When I saw the dog, the party I thank God for it. The dog then this cousin of mine came here with the children, and the dog they died the dog because by that time the dog was on the on the uh, radios and everything. So they tied the dog in brown. And the dog used to bark to himself in the mirror because he didn't recognize himself. And, so, and he came as the dog with the children. At that time, they came out, the children came out, and they in and out to, to Cuba. So you wanted me to, to speak about what? Well, we were talking about uh by the way, you, you talked about this dog of yours, Cinco, yes. and uh, well, did, this didn't dog you, after you gave it to your your cousin, cousin then later we were re reunited with the dog back in Miami, yes, and I when did. the dog died, the, yes, didn't the you dog have, oh, many years after he lived until he was eleven. He lived with you. Yes, he lived with me. Yes, and he died, and you had how did the dog die? Uh, the dog, uh, he was eleven years, and these kind of. Dalmatians. He was a Dalmatian. Don't live uh, too long. But the fact is that I took him to a stupid vet that gave him uh, four or five shots at the same time. He was old enough and his uh, kidneys failed. There was no way of saving him. And I, I took him to the vet. Then everybody told me I was very uh, selfish, not wanting to leave the dog with the vet, and that he uh, should be there. I used to go and visit him twice every day. And uh, the last day I saw him, I, w I went there, and he used to go very obediently because I sent him, now we say goodbye, I'll come to see you tomorrow and uh, don't worry, I'll be here in time. And I spoke to him, he understood me very well. And when he was leaving, he turned back and looked at me with such a sad eyes that I was highly shocked. I said, I went to him again, kissed him again, and said, I'll come tomorrow, I promise you. He turned his back and never looked at me and went behind the bed who was taking him to. I never saw him alive again. The next day, I was the, in, in the morning, uh, the, the vet told me, uh, he's better, so you can come tonight and take him with you. So when they came for me, my daughter came for me, I told her, now we're going to go for Cinco because I can pick him up tonight. And I saw that she was evading the answer. I said, what's the matter? She said, well, you know, I, uh, I don't think you should go to... T I said, Sinker's dead. So she said, yes, he died. You can imagine that. I was sunk into the deep sea of anguish because to me, Sinko was Sinko, but it was a great link with my husband, too. We had this dog that we have raised. Uh, he traveled all Europe with us. He used to go to the mountains with us, climb the mountains with us. 
uh, he used to do uh, whatever we did. We used to take him to restaurants. He sat in the chair and waited for his pate. Hmm? And uh, very amusing, he used to travel between my husband and I in the car, uh, lying there. Sometimes my husband was carried away by the beauty of the landscape, and he used to tell me, Mira, Mira, which means look, look. Huh? And the first one that got up and looked was the dog. He always looked at it. It was a, a trait on him, very amusing, very... Uh, uh, so uh, he was so attached to me that uh, he slept with me there, next to me in my bed. And the loss of the dog, I used to sometimes speak to the students about the dog. So that morning I came. And you know I'm not uh, uh, subject to any kind of showing uh, things uh, in the sense of showing sadness. Uh, but the students said, well, how is the dog today? I said, well, listen, I'm going to tell you something. The dog is dead. Let's not speak any more about the dog, ever. When I'm ready to speak about him, I will tell you, but I cannot speak about him anymore because I didn't want to go cry. I cry very seldom, but the, I couldn't help crying for the year. And it's a very peculiar thing. Every time I speak of him, I feel I have lost something extremely attached to my heart. It's uh, years have not deemed down the anguish. I felt when he died. Uh, with him, uh, sort of, I felt the hopes I had for seeing my husband again and uh, to recouping uh, the country, our house, our things, our re souvenirs of all our life, uh, was sinking with him. Uh, it, everything sank with him. So it was a uh, uh, the love of an animal you have uh, uh, praised, but also the love of a great friend you have lost. You see, it was to me, a, and still, I still feel the, I never wanted to have a dog again, never. How did you come by the dog originally? The dog, my brother, Michel, Miguel, had a, a very pure breed of Dalmatians. Uh, he was a dog, they, they claim that this kind of dog only comes out in the very pure uh, breeds. Uh, he was what they call liver spot. He was not black and white, but very dark brown and white. And uh, his spots were definitely never one near to the other. They were all, uh, he, his coat was the most beautiful spot that you can imagine. And uh, his allure, he looked like a swan more than his uh, head was, uh, he moved the head with the uh, elegance of a swan. His eyes were extremely intelligent and uh, he was extremely loyal to me, extremely loyal. It was your brother who bought you the dog, or no, no, he had the breed. He bre oh, he, bred them. he had he had a lot of dogs. He gave them away. He gave it to Andres and I. He that came was, where was that? Little puppy. This was in Cuba. In Cuba. He had a, a, a big house near Havana, a modern, done by an architect who was a, a, a student of Gropius. So he was uh, a great uh, modern. He had a very interesting house, and he had animals, horses, and all kinds of. And uh, among them, he had this. Uh, he had like four Dalmatians or three, because he gave them away when they were born. And they were incredible intelligent. The Dalmatian is probably one of the most intelligent. Uh, intelligent breeds of dog. You had the dog, uh, when Cinco died, you had him cremated, didn't you? Yes. I cremated him because 
I didn't want him to disappear into the earth. I want him to be with me. He's with me always. You have the ashes in your home. And I have the ashes. The day I died, I asked him to pour them, even with me or with Andres. He was as well attached to me as he was to Andres. And uh, but one peculiar thing. Whenever we received a little paper, you know, I was months and months without receiving any letters and, and very few letters in the whole 22 years because they, they confiscated his letters. They didn't let him, they confiscated the paper, they didn't let him. But when he could pass a letter, pass a little paper giving me uh, reason that he was still living, uh, I had to hide it, because if the dog smelled it, he just grabbed it and wouldn't leave it to me. And he put his, uh, his paw over it, and he growled and growled even to me. He didn't want to leave the baby. You see, he, it was a, an extraordinary thing. And well, when we talked last, you. You talked about the hanging the dog over, and then you were arrested again. And I take it finally you were released and came back to Miami. I came back to Miami before Andres, of course. And of course, Andres remained in jail, uh, which was a great mistake. In jail, uh, no, he didn't remain in jail. But I might say he remained in the embassy, where we had finally taken refuge. Which but, embassy? Uh, the embassy of Ecuador. And, uh, but the French, because the French didn't receive uh, uh, refugees, but the French uh, influence of the French embassy and uh, uh, they released me. I think sometimes they released me to hurt Andres. They didn't release Andres. They didn't give him permission to, uh, to leave. But uh, they gave me. I didn't want to leave, but Andres insisted that I leave because he said, you can do more for Cuba in the exile than in exile than you can do here. And we have to work, we have to forget our, our emotions and our affections and do what we have to do for our country and for my country and for... So, and even for me, you can do more outside than here. So, I accepted and I came to Miami I found the dog in a terrible state. Yeah, they had put him in a room. They didn't let him go out. Um, a, a dog that was as free as the leaves of the trees in autumn. <laughs> and uh, he couldn't. Uh, when he saw me, that dog, I thought he was going to die. He jumped up to the ceiling for half an hour, all the time. He came to me. He threw himself against me. He was, well, I was very, uh, and uh, and then he used to go to the street, uh, to the door, and look at the door, as telling me that, where is Andres? I don't see Andres. And you see, that was again another problem. Well, I, we never separated after that. I never left him, he, he was with me. I bought, I, br I brought, I brought from Cuba. When I was, uh, in prison, they gave me five minutes out to go into the garden, and I took, I saw a little thing like a ball of cotton on the floor, and I saw it move, so I went to see what it was. It was a little bird. I took that, and I put it within my, inside my blouse. So I came in, and when I was, I was released that same day. Uh, into the embassy. We went into the embassy. In the embassy, I took care of him, and I sew uh, up his, uh, what you call this part of the, of the, the throat of the birds, and you know, where they eat, and they keep the food. It was all broken, something had, so I saw it with a needle and some thread, and the bird lived to be a turtle uh, dove. And he called me everybody, everybody. It was a male tur turtle dove. 
Uh, I have pictures of him. He was uh, there with Andres and I in the embassy. When we left the embassy, decided to bring him. So I put him in my blouse and uh, went into the airplane. He used to move around my blouse, all around me, screaming, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The people look at me a little stranger and the other way, I said. Well, finally, when I came to immigration, uh, immigration man uh, was interrogating me for letting me come back, letting me enter the country. And he saw that, he heard that noise, and he said, you must be feeling very nervous and sick. Go home. I'm going to let you go with to you house here, because I have told him I had a house here. I lived then in Westchester, and uh, you see the compassion uh, of that man. I said, well, listen, I'll go home, but I have this bird. It's forbidden by the laws of me. I said, but this bird was with me in jail, and this bird was with me all the time. and." My husband and I are very sick. He said, okay, don't worry. We're going to see a doctor, one of the uh, experts in animals here. You go home now. He comes down a minute. He'll see the bird. You take the bird home. And Wednesday when you come, you bring again the bird so they can go for him to see if he doesn't have any sickness or anything because that is why they don't let birds enter here unless they have a casualty. But they kept in a quarantine home, the bird, and they let me take the bird home. Well, the bird was with me like six months. I called him uh, after St. Francis. I called him Francisco, but I called him Panchito because that's the name the Cubans gave to the, uh, the Spanish, gave to the uh, Francis, Pancho. So I called him Panchito. When Panchito was about six months here, he and Cinco at the beginning were a little hostile one with the other. But still it is stopped when I called Cinco and said, you cannot do that. This bird, and explained to him, you cannot persecute the bird. They ended by Panchito sleeping on Cinco's head. And sometimes he picked Cinco, and Cinco looked at him as saying, this nuisance they have imposed on me, but he never did anything to it. So they were, but Panchito grew, and there were other birds around, and he showed me he wanted to go out. So I let him go out, and he disappeared. Like a certain time after, he appears with a mate and little birds, and I took all of them and fed them and took them. When I moved to Coral Gables, I took them with me <laughs> and showed them where I was, and I released them. They remained there and uh, for years and years, and they had more birds, and it, it, they had suddenly all kinds of turtle <laughs> doves, and there still are turtle doves. Now Panchito probably one day didn't come anymore. Uh, but this was like 10 years after, or 12. So animals have been a great part of my life. You, you mentioned earlier that one of your great fondnesses as a child was your horse. Did you ride horses? I rode horses all my life. I even jumped uh -huh. officially for the, uh, uh, the uh, for France into uh, contest uh, around in Italy and Spain different countries. All that is lost because those were my pictures, my cuttings of the uh, of papers. Like most of them, the art critique about my uh, paintings has... That was lost in your what, in your home in Cuba? In Cuba, I didn't... Uh, there were personal things that they took away and destroyed. And so. That is, in essence, uh, when then I survived those years, exile, 
my father died. Uh, the 67. The year I came here. So time. for t yeah, all the years that I knew you, of course, we knew that your husband was in jail. He was in various prisons in Cuba for 22 years. Yes, different prisons. And you spent the time you weren't teaching. You spent trying to get him out. And yes. Many interesting. All the time doing everything. I was. Um, uh, one night, I was called by Ambassador um, Smith, the one who had been, uh, he was a friend of ours, he and his wife, Florence. And uh, he said, Marie, can you be very early here tomorrow? It was uh, in Palm Beach, West Palm Beach. I knew him money. To raise the money to go to West Palm Beach was something. I didn't have money. I was just teaching here, teaching there, and it scarcely because I had with me my old father, my uh, niece, uh, the, the, the daughter and the son of my uh, sister, and uh, the daughter of one of my brothers. All these people lived with me, and my father was offered a uh, to give him something, uh, you know, they give the refugees. He refused. <laughs> he refused because he thought that was receiving money from a foreign country. And though he was very uh, grateful to be here, but he had been ambassador in the United States, and he didn't think it was correct to receive. Well, he was not an American citizen. Uh, he should not receive money because they needed the money for the people in the country, not for uh, foreigners. People were very strict uh, uh, matters of honesty, ethics, and all. Uh, before I forget, when I was a diplomat, I was a, a, uh, a delegate to the United Nations. I received two. Uh, sort of, how can I say this, uh, of, of compliments from the, one from the English government and one from the, um, uh, from Australia. Uh, because uh, they, uh, about something in the, in the matter that came out there and I defended the, the point yeah. And they thought it was very well defended. And to be nice, as they knew my father was an ambassador, they sent him a copy so he could appreciate. And uh, when uh, I came to him and said, did you receive the, he said, yes, and I compliment you on your work because it, is, uh, it shows that you have worked very well. But I'm going to give you an advice as an old diplomat. Try never to receive compliments of foreign countries for your act, act, attitude, because that means that you have served their interests and not the, those of your own country. So he was a very careful person. So Ambassador Smith invited you up to Palm Beach. Yes. Ambassador Smith invited me that day to Palm Beach. Well, I have to raise the money, get out of my house at four o'clock in the morning, and see how I could walk to the downtown. Uh, there was no buses at that time. I couldn't afford to have a taxi, so I had to walk down to downtown to the uh, place for the buses to part for uh, Palm Beach. Reach Palm Beach there. I had to take another bus to go to the uh, West Palm Beach, which is it. I arrived there and uh, I was received immediately by Florence. She was such a darling, Florence Smith. She died now. She, they told me she committed suicide. I don't know. I've never been able to verify the fact. 
Well, the fact is that uh, he told me that he came and said, you know, the uh, Felt Kennedy, which is the attorney general, is going to be here with me today. Now I want you to present his case to them to see if they can do something to get your husband out of jail. So I was delighted. He went inside and uh, I, I stayed in the terrace they had that faced the sea with plants talking. Suddenly a small boat with a young man, which I recognized immediately as Bob Kennedy, barefoot, dressed in uh, uh, sailing attire, white pant, t-shirt, comes into it. I, Florence, he goes inside. After a time, a very elegant butler, Servant, but very elegantly dressed, comes and says, Ambassador uh, Smith wants you to go to this uh, office. So Florence says, Good luck, Marie. So I went there. And I see Ambassador Smith comes to the door to greet me. He takes me, offers me a chair. Well, this time, there was a young man looking through a window and giving me his back. The legs are open, his feet are all spare. And uh, uh, Ambassador Smith tells me, this gentleman, which is very near to the Attorney General, very close to the Attorney General, uh, wants you to tell him uh, about what happened with your husband. So I told them that we have to, they told them the story. I was a little shocked that the young man didn't even turn his face, didn't even say hello. He was, I was not presented to, uh, introduced to him. He was not introduced to me, rather. And uh, uh, you see, we were among diplomats. My husband was still an ambassador or whatever. Uh, I was the daughter of an ambassador, and I was the wife of an ambassador. I was myself in the diplomatic career. I was, not, I was not an ambassador, but I had a position. I was a delegate to the United Nations, and uh, they had no right of treating me what I thought was highly discourteous. But I didn't want to make an issue by the safety of my husband was above everything. I knew it was him. I knew who the person was. So uh, he said, I told my, the story the shortest way I could. And then, without turning his face, he addresses the uh, Ambassador Smith, and he tells him, uh, this, uh, tell this lady to present a letter telling uh, the uh, government of the United States that president or any other minister of state telling them that the Americans have uh, put her, the, her, her husband into Cuba. Therefore, the Americans should get him out of Cuba in some way or the other. I saw red there. I got very angry. And I said to the ambassador, Ambassador, will you tell this gentleman who is so near or so close to the Attorney General? To the Attorney General, yeah. because that's the way oh, I see. he had been told me. I said, will you tell him that my husband was not pushed by the Americans to do his duty towards his, uh, his country. That he doesn't need to be pushed to do it. And the Americans didn't even that. In fact, the CIA opposed him to go. And he went on spite of everything. So I'm not writing a letter in those terms. 
if the president and this gentleman who is so near the attorney general, who happens to be the brother of the president, if they want to do something for my husband, they know the story now. They can do it, and I will ask the president directly in a letter to uh, see if he can do something to my, for my husband, but not on those terms, because they are not true and they are false. So I came out of the room and said goodbye. He said, you know, you should not get excited. I'm not excited. Is this discourtesy? Uh, I have never spoken to anybody. Uh, of course, he hasn't spoken to me, but still, I have never received messages in this way. Well, if, he, if they can do something for my husband, then I met. Uh, Prophet was there, and she met me. And she, what happened? I said, well, your husband will tell you. I went home, at home, very upset. It's the first time. You see, I had never been in contact with discourtesy in my life uh, because for social reasons I was born in an ambience where the people are courteous. And when my husband came and I told him the story, he being a lawyer and being a man of great reflection, made some explanations for that attitude that I did not understand. He says, my husband said that perhaps he didn't want to be responsible as himself to face me. And that's why, so I could never say, he faced me, he told me, he promised, he, he did, and uh, so that he, I said, well, they should have not seen me then. But Andre says, well, you know, the official people, the Americans especially, have their own ways of not wanting to get compromised. A Latin would have probably given you the face, would have even invited you to say it, ask you how you felt and all this. But this man was up to the thing, up to the point, and he uh, thought she can never say she spoke to me, she can never say I did, I said. So probably, after years, uh, when Andres came, he told me that, and probably that was the cause. But I really had, was so hurt uh, with the whole family. I, of course, I, I was very sad that they killed the president. I wasn't so sad when they killed him because I didn't have any sympathy for him, but it, anyway, it was a murder. But the president, yes, because I think with years and more experience, and he, he had the, uh, the wood, the material, to make a great man out of him, I think. He would have been uh, uh, something important to this country. I was very, very sad. You met other people, too. You met a lot of Ru you met Russians frequently, trying to get Andreas Well, I went out. to Switzerland. And I spoke with the Russian delegation there. I had lunch with them. They invited me to a lunch with the Czech uh, uh, delegation. I had interviews with them. I had interviews with the Pope, with Giscard d'Estaing, which is related uh, à la mode de Bretagne. Uh, uh, Giscard d'Estaing married a Kerjean in the 17th century. And he gave me the miniature that he kept. It has disappeared, I don't know where it is. But I had the miniature that he gave me that of my uh, ancestor marrying one of his ancestors. He would arrange these meetings with? He arranged a meeting in, uh, in, uh, in Ireland with the Pope. He met the Pope in Ireland and I spoke with the Pope 45 minutes. Probably he told me, when your husband comes out, come and see me. I said, well, if I have money, I will. He says, you don't have to have money. I will send you the uh, ticket. That's why when he came here, he asked that Andres and I took 
the offerings for him. And then you got rained out, right? Yes, the rain got rained out. To cancel the mass. Yes. I was looking for, I was going to watch you on television doing that. I was so disappointed. Well, that was, he was very, uh, he, he said he was going to pray for him and that he had the hunch that he will return to me. And he did. Andres came back. Those were long years for you. Uh, Very your, long. And, and of course, even financial difficulties, having known a wealthy lifestyle. I remember for a while there you, you had no phone, no telephone. No telephone. I couldn't have, uh, I, well, I did have at the beginning, but with the calls to Cuba and all this, <laughs> I, I, I got a great, uh, I mean, a great uh, uh, account, so I had to be paying the account. And, I couldn't reinstall my telephone. I couldn't uh, reinstall it. I was at six months or more without any telephone. And uh, no air condition, of course. And uh, so once I was a month without light because I couldn't afford it. was with candles. Uh, the only money entry to my house was my salary, and I had people to take care of. On the other hand, I had a chauffeur <laughs> because it was my old chauffeur that came here and he and his wife lived with me uh, and they didn't want to leave me. So it was uh, years of... Did you, did you think during that time, did you ever have any second thoughts about that adventure to Cuba? Did you, did you ever, ever think you could have had a very nice life with Andres? Had you not decided to be courageous? No, because, courageous. Uh, you see, I was raised in the patriotic aspect of things. And I always admired Andres for being able to uh, just to give up everything for the sake of his country. It is. Uh, so I never thought about those things because I respect Andres for what he did. I don't uh, pass my personal uh, welfare or happiness over to me. Uh, I'm patriotic. <laughs> and finally, what, after occasional letters from him and you would get word and... Well, finally, I must say that they announced he was coming. And uh, as you very well know, I didn't believe it because several times it was announced when they released uh, Uber Matos and all that. Uh, they announced that Vargas Gomez uh, was coming, but he never. So I didn't believe uh, two or three times, you remember, they said the possibility. And I didn't, I went even to teach that day. I didn't think he was coming. And you and Zarela, as you remember, were the ones, in fact, I always, Zarela had been my student. I always had a great affection for Zarela. But after that, I feel in debt to Zarela. Uh, and to you, of course, because you were very attentive with all the things of Andres, and you collected whatever spoke about him, and you kept it for me. And I'm really grateful for those years of companionship and affection that you and Amelia and other teachers here, very few, but Dr. Jacobstein, Drakeford, Chitwood, but they came later. At the beginning it was only you and uh, uh, Amelia. So you saw your husband for the first time in 20 years amid the glare of... 25 years. 25. 25 because we had been se uh, separated before um, a year, uh, almost you know, uh, 22 years of prison, yeah. of prison, plus a year and a half that he was retained in Cuba without letting him come. Yeah. It was 25 years. And of course, all the television, it was four in the morning, and all the television cameras, and hundreds of well, reporters. And you were both, your pictures are on the cover of the 
front page of the New York Times the next morning. You were interviewed by Brian Gumbel on the Today Show, I remember, the next morning. Uh, Cat Shot once made a, a trip here, to, but I didn't want to say anything because I, I thought I could uh, really hurt my husband more than help him. And uh, I couldn't lie. I had to say, I say that what was true, he would have been again put into. Now, you know, he used to publish things while he was in jail and send them here, not to me, but outside, to people outside, because he was afraid I suppressed them. They were signed with his own name, denouncing all the horrors of the prison and all that. But you never lost faith all that time. You were no, I did not, because my believer. faith is in God. Yeah. Uh, and uh, God cannot be manipulated by anything. So then suddenly you went from from poverty almost to to well, to going to the White House. And yes, being received. You, you met Reagan President. a couple of times. Being, you? you know, they wanted to give the the award of the best teacher of the United States that year, but I couldn't receive it because I was not an American citizen. Huh. They offered me that, and I said I. Was but you were certainly celebrities well, for, and I you still are. Yeah, well. And of course, that, that lasted, that joy lasted for a couple of years, and then you had a, a bit of an interruption with your accident. Yes, the accident was. But in the middle of the accident, I always remember that he was back. And that kept me uh, thanking God for my accident, because I always think that life is a succession of happy events and unfortunately events. And I said, this event is the unfortunate one after the great happiness of having. So this kept me quite on the, not very quite, but happy to think about that in a way I was atoning for the happiness I have had by his return. So... You were in the hospital for several four months. months? Four months. Four months, exactly. There were many who didn't think you would live. No, I know. I know that... Um, many, no, nobody thought I could live, not even the doctors. When they thought I was out of my mind, they, they were asking, what are the chances well, uh, next to me? And the doctor said next to me, she has almost a 10%. And I was listening to it. And I was thinking, that's what you think. But I will survive. I didn't, never thought I was going to die. I thought that I was going to survive. I had pains and, but. I knew I was going to survive. I don't, uh, I'm not pessimistic. And I, I knew that my husband needed me, that the good Lord couldn't inflict on him uh, a sort of, uh, wouldn't, not couldn't, he could do whatever he wants, the good Lord, but he's too good to inflict on us certain kind of pains. And the great pain wouldn't have only wouldn't have been only to lose me. It's, he was driving, and that would have given him a complex of guilt and guiltlessness for forever. The accident itself. Uh, part of it, yes, and not. I remember banging one of the times, but this long, only recently. I have been four years without any, uh, it's not, it's going to be in October five years, you know? no four years, no. I don't recall exactly, but this was the year. Uh, but you were broken up completely, you were, yes. all your legs, I had your arms. two legs broken, uh, 
the, the bones out of the legs. Eh? Uh, I had the hip broken. I had one arm destroyed and one shoulder. And then my teeth went into the head. They had to bring them down. With I was three months with wires pulling down my teeth out of my head because my teeth went into them. And then the bones of my forehead broke. I have two little nails here. I call them the horns of abundance. And they gave you a new nose too, didn't they? Uh, well, not exactly, but they, um, it was very, uh, it's getting to be the old shape again, because what it was, it was in pain. I had it uh, swollen. It, I have been swollen for three years, uh, Ronnie. Only now, my mouth is being feeling comfortable to speak. I had the, the mouth was tight. I couldn't. I have been uh, the face. My face was swollen, and I was constantly, constantly, constantly. Uh, how do you call that? Uh, dizzy. Uh, at the beginning, I was personally persuaded I had a tumor or something of the sort. Uh, I just learned how to keep myself standing. It's amazing. And I told myself not to limp, and uh, not at least too much. I limp a little yet. You had to learn how to use your hand, I noticed. Well, it took therapy. I can, I can, no therapy. The therapy is myself. Yeah. I just force the hand to work. And I prayed. Hmm? Prayer. Prayer is the secret. But you were never bitter at all. I would be very no. bitter after all that suffering, waiting for Andres and finding the great I'm joy. not bitter. No, you wouldn't be bitter if you had so much to thank God for. Uh, you see, uh, as I tell you, the Lord sends you sometimes permits that you have a varied life alternate life. Uh, the, the totally happy, happy people become stupid. Really. After 22 years here at St. Thomas University, Biscayne College formerly, and all of your experiences, are you, are you optimistic about the future of the I'm Earth? very optimistic because I can see through my students what is going to be the United States. In spite of what they say about youth, I can see a great affection in them, uh, a great um, tenderness, I would say, and a country that has those feelings and that they, I see honesty, I see certain very good traits in all these youth. A country that has that youth cannot go astray. And uh, this college, I suppose it will be uh, our shelter until the end of our capacities to teach. So I will. I love it. I've been here. Great friends. We have been like a big family. No. They aren't. You want to see me this?